we join the actress Gwen Franklin Davis and friends at the Studio Theatre in Covent Garden's Theatre Museum to celebrate her 100th birthday next month. Alec McCowan and Anna Massey are reading a selection of her favourite poetry and prose, and Gwen herself will recite some of her most famous roles from memory. Now, I will introduce us, you see. Well, you all know Alec as a wonderful actor. And for me, he did the most wonderful thing. He illuminated the gospel according to St. Mark in such a way that I had never, never visualized it before. It made the deepest impression on me. I've never forgotten it. I saw it three times, Alec. It was, for me, a memorable and never-to-be-forgotten occasion. If you never did anything else in all of your career, darling, you would go straight into heaven because of that one. Thank you, Gwen. <laughs> And Anna, my little Anna, my darling little Anna, she's half the age of me, of course, you see. But, uh, <laughs> half the age of... <laughs> but uh, we've been great friends for a very long time, and I love her, and I've seen her grow in stature and glory, and now she's particularly happy because she is so happily married, and that is very nice indeed, and I'm so glad for you. I look forward to meeting that husband of yours. You'll you be will. careful you now. Will yeah. <laughs> I mean, I may be a hundred, but oh. <laughs> anyway, darling Anna, it's lovely to be with you, and I'm sure we're going to enjoy ourselves. I can't remember what we're going to start with. I haven't an idea. The Kingdom of God oh, by yes. Francis Thompson. That's you. Yes, lovely. O world invisible, we view thee. O world intangible, we touch thee. O world unknowable, we know thee. Inapprehensible, we clutch thee. Does the fish soar to find the ocean? The eagle plunge to find the air? That we ask of the stars in motion if they have rumor of thee there? Not where the wheeling systems darken and our benumbed conceiving soars, the drift of pinions, would we hearken, beats at our own clay-shuttered doors. The angels keep their ancient places, turn but a stone and start a wing. Tis ye, tis your estranged faces that miss the many splendid thing. But when so sad thou canst not sadder cry, and upon thy so sore loss shall shine the traffic of Jacob's ladder pitched betwixt heaven and Charing Cross. Yea, in the night, my soul, my daughter, cry, clinging heaven by the hems, and lo, Christ walking on the water, not of Gennesareth, but Thames. I don't always understand, but the end of that poem, although I may not understand it altogether uh, intellectually, I do understand it spiritually. And it is the spiritual thing of his poetry that I find very, yes, very memorable and, and uplifting when I, when I can really get to grips with it. Thank you for reading it so beautifully, darling. Thank you. Yes. We're now going to do a scene from The Merchant of Venice. Oh, that'll be fun, yes. Do you ever Wait. play Portia? <laughs> well, I haven't, actually. <laughs> One of the few. Well, I, uh, for many years... My godmother, a certain Miss Agnes Harris, was the companion of Ellen Terry. And as a little girl, at the age of four, I was taken to play with a collection of dolls which Ellen Terry had, and a little doll's tea set, which she gave me and which I have to this day. And so for all my life, uh, in a way, uh, I have had this idol, Ellen Terry. And when I was a little girl of about four, and people said, well, what are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to do? And I say, I am going to be an actress like Miss Terry. <laughs> she was a wonderful person, of course, and I saw her only as she was an old lady, and uh, uh, she did the, the trial scene, I remember it very well. All right, we start. Oh, by my trot, Nerissa, my little body is a weary of this great world. You would be, sweet madam, if your miseries were in the same abundance as your good fortunes are. And yet, for aught I see... They are as sick that surfeit with too much as they that starve with nothing. It is no mean happiness, therefore, to be seated in the mean. <laughs> Superfluity comes sooner by white hairs, but competency lives longer. <laughs> oh, good sentences and well pronounced. They would be better if well followed. Oh, if to do. If I was the goodest to know what was good to be done, chapels had been churches and poor men's cottages, princes' palaces. 
I can easier tell 20 what were good to be done than to be one of the 20 to follow my own teaching. Oh, me, this word choose. I can neither choose whom I would nor refuse whom I dislike. Is it not hard, Marissa, that I cannot neither choose one nor refuse none? Oh, your no. father was ever virtuous, and holy men at their death have good inspirations. Therefore, the lottery that he hath devised in these three chests of gold, silver, and lead, whereof who chooses his meaning chooses you, you will no doubt never be chosen by any rightly, but one you no. shall rightly love. But what warmth is there in your affection towards any of these princely suitors that are <laughs> already come? Oh, well, I pray thee overname them, and as I names them, I will describe them. And according to my inscription, level at my affection. First, there is the Neapolitan prince. Aye, that's a colt indeed, for he can talk of nothing but his horse, <laughs> and he makes it a great show of his approbation to his own good parts that he can show him himself. <laughs> oh, I much have feared my lady, his mother, played false with a smith. <laughs> then there is the county palatine Ah, oh, he does nothing but frown as who should say and you will not have me choose he hears merry tales and smiles not I fear he will prove the weeping philosopher in his age being so full of unmannerly sadness in his youth oh, God defend me from these two <laughs> what say you then to Falconbridge the young baron of England <laughs> <laughs> you know, I say nothing to him, for he understands not me nor I him. He hath neither Latin, French, nor Italian. And you will come into the court and swear that I've got a poor pennyworth in the English. <laughs> oh, he's a proper man's picture, but alas, who can converse with a dumb show? <laughs> How like you the young German, the Duke of Saxony's nephew? Very vilely in the morning when he's sober and most vilely in the afternoon when he's drunk. <laughs> mm. The worst fall that ever fell, I hope I shall learn to do without him. Mm. If he should offer to choose and choose the right casket, you should refuse to perform your father's will if you should refuse to accept him. Therefore, for fear of the worst, I prithee put a deep glass of Rhenish wine on the contrary casket. For as the devil be within, and that temptation without... I know he will choose it. I will do anything, Nerissa, ere I will be married to a sponge. <laughs> <laughs> you need not fear, lady, the having any of these lords. They have acquainted me with their determinations, which is indeed to return to their home and to trouble you with no more suit, unless you may be won by some other sort than your father's imposition, depending on the casket. If I be as old as Sibylla, I will die as chaste as Diana, unless I be obtained in the manner of my father's will. <laughs> oh, I'm glad this parcel of words is so reasonable, for there is not one among them, but I dote on his very absence, and I pray God give them a fair departure. <laughs> <coughs> madam. Uh, is what, what now? The four strangers seek for you, madam, to take their leave, and there is a forerunner come from a fifth, the Prince of Morocco who brings word the prince's master will be here tonight. Oh, well, if I could bid the fifth welcome with as good a heart as I can bid the other four farewell, I should be glad of his approach. <laughs> <laughs> Come, Nerissa, Sira go before. While we shut the gate on one wooer, another knocks at the door. <laughs> Well, Gwen, the next item is uh, These I Have Loved by Rupert Brooke. Oh, lovely, yes. Now, These I Have Loved, too. I've loved those things, and I've loved Rupert Brooke for 50 years, yes. White plates and cups, clean gleaming, ringed with blue lines, and feathery, fairy dust, wet roofs beneath the lamplight, the strong crust of friendly bread and many-tasting food, rainbows, and the blue bitter smoke of wood, and radiating raindrops couching in cool flowers, and flowers themselves that sway through sunny hours, dreaming of moths that drink them under the moon. Then the cool kindliness of sheets that soon smooth away trouble, and the rough male kiss of blankets, grainy wood, Live hair that is shining and free, blue massing clouds, the keen, 
unpassioned beauty of a great machine, the benison of hot water, furs to touch, the good smell of old clothes and other such, the comfortable smell of friendly fingers, hair's fragrance, and the musty reek that lingers about dead leaves and last year's ferns. Gwen, I believe you have some special memories of the Seven Pillars of Wisdom by T.E. Oh, Lawrence. Yes, indeed, Eric, I did. Well, my great friend Martha Van and I were besotted about the, the Seven Pillars of Wisdom and, and, and Lawrence of Arabia. And we had a holiday somewhere, I can't remember what it was, somewhere in the sea, and we took the Seven Pillars of Wisdom with us and we read it aloud. And it made an impression on us both. And I've never forgotten it. And then, of course, one knew a, a, a bit about him. But he was a secretive sort of mystery man, wasn't he, Lawrence, uh, 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 most of the time. And then when he put it all behind him and wanted anonymity, I think is the word, and became Air Craftsman Shaw. And then many years since, Mrs. Thomas Hardy, who was a great friend uh, uh, of uh, Air Craftsman Shaw, as he was then. And uh, one day, Mrs. Uh, Mahardy rang up to say, she w would I come to lunch? She was having a few people, and uh, Lawrence was going to come. And I was absolutely thrilled at the thought of uh, meeting this idol of mine that I'd adored, you know, for so long. I had a real schoolgirl schwärmer eye for him. And uh, so I came, and he arrived and, uh, as Air Craftsman Shaw, just in his ordinary, you know, uniform. And I sat next to him. I was absolutely dumb. I could hardly utter for, you know, admiration. <laughs> so I don't remember. He was an extremely silent person. He didn't really make much in the way of conversation, as I remember. But uh, I can remember he had a piercing blue eyes. I'd never seen such blue that they looked straight through you and seemed to go right through you and button behind your back. I, wonderful <laughs> eyes. Wonderful an excerpt from Seven Pillars of Wisdom by T.E. Lawrence. Some of the evil of my tale may have been inherent in our circumstances. For years we lived anyhow with one another in the naked desert under the indifferent heaven. By day the hot sun fermented us and we were dizzied by the beating wind. At night we were stained by dew and shamed into pettiness by the innumerable silences of stars. We were a self-centered army without parade or gesture, devoted to freedom the second of man's creeds, a purpose so ravenous that it devoured all our strength, a hope so transcendent that our earlier ambitions faded in its glare. As time went by, our need to fight for the ideal increased to an unquestioning possession, riding with spur and rein over our doubts. Willy-nilly it became a faith. We had sold ourselves into its slavery, manacled ourselves together in its chain gang, bowed ourselves to serve its holiness with all our good and ill content. We had learned that there were pangs too sharp, griefs too deep, ecstasies too high for our finite selves to register. When emotion reached this pitch, the mind choked and memory went white till the circumstances were humdrum once more. Such exaltation of thought while it let adrift the spirit and gave it license in strange airs, lost it the old patient rule over the body. The body was too coarse to feel the utmost of our sorrows and of our joys, therefore we abandoned it as rubbish. We left it below us to march forward, a breathing simulacrum on its own unaided level, subject to influences from which in normal times our instincts would have shrunk. The men were young and sturdy, and hot flesh and blood unconsciously claimed a right in them and tormented their bellies with strange longings. Our privations and dangers fanned this virile heat in a climate as racking as can be conceived. We had no shut places to be alone in, no thick clothes to hide our nature. Man in all things lived candidly with man. Well, now, <clears throat> The Family Reunion was um, a play that I did, oh, a long time ago, and with Sybil and Lewis and 
Paul Schofield, and a wonderful cast that read the choruses. And I think they were never so wonderfully read before or since. In an old house, there is always whispering, and more is heard than is spoken, and what is spoken remains in the room, waiting for the future to hear it. The agony of the curtained bedroom, whether of birth or of dying, gathers into itself all the voices of the past and projects them into the future. The treble voices on the lawn, the mowing of hay in summer, the dogs and the old pony, the stumble and the wail of little pain, the chopping of wood in autumn and the singing in the kitchen, the steps at night in the corridor, all twined and tangled together, all are recorded. There is no avoiding these things, and whether in Argos or England, there are certain inflexible laws unalterable in the nature of music. There is nothing at all to be done about it. There is nothing to do about anything. And now it is nearly time for the news. We must listen to the weather report and the international catastrophes. <laughs> the Last Duchess by Robert Browning. Now that's my last duchess painted on the wall looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will please you sit and look at her? I said Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and seemed as they would ask me if they durst how such a glance came there. So, not the first to you to turn and ask thus. Sir... It was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess' cheek. Perhaps, Fra Pandolf chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart... How shall I say? Too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. So it was all one. My favour at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bow of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least. She thanked men. Good, but thanked somehow, uh, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. Who? stoop to blame this sort of trifling even had you skill in speech which i have not to make your will quite clear to such an one and say just this or that in you disgusts me here you miss or there exceed the mark and if she let herself be less and so nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse even then would be some stooping and i choose never to stoop oh sir she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? This grew. I gave commands. Then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will please you rise? We'll meet the company below, then. I repeat, the Count, your master's known munificence, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. Oh. Remember by Christina Rossetti. Remember me when I am gone away, gone far away into the silent land, 
When you can no more hold me by the hand, nor I half turn to go, yet turning, stay. Remember me, when no more day by day you tell me of our future that you planned. Only remember me. You understand it will be late to counsel then or pray. Yet if you should forget me for a while and afterwards remember, do not grieve. For if the darkness and corruption leave a vestige of the thoughts that once I had, better by far you should forget and smile than that you should remember and be sad. When played Queen Catherine from Henry VIII in the Festival of Britain production, Queen Catherine is ill, near death, at Kim Bolton. She is with Griffith, her gentleman usher, and Patience, her loyal lady in waiting. How does your grace? Uh, oh, Griffith, sick to death. My legs, like loaden branches, bow to earth, willing to leave their burden. <laughs> oh, oh, so. So now I feel a little ease. Didst thou not tell me, Griffith, as thou ledst me, that the great child of honor, Cardinal Wolsey, was dead? Yes, madam. Ah. But I think your grace, out of the pain you suffered, gave no ear to it. Pretty good, Griffith. Tell me how he died. Well, the voice goes, madam. For after the stout Earl Northumberland arrested him at York and brought him forward as a man sorely tainted to his answer, mm. he fell sick suddenly and grew so ill he could not sit his mule. Alas, poor man. At last, with easy roads, he came to Leicester, lodged in the abbey where the Reverend Abbot with all his covenant honorably received mm. him, to whom he gave these words, O oh, Father Abbot, an old man, broken with the storms of state, is come to lay his weary bones among ye. Give him a little earth for charity. So went to bed, where eagerly his sickness pursued him still, and three nights after this, about the hour of eight, which he himself foretold should be his last, full of repentance, continual meditations, tears and sorrows, he gave his honors to the world again, his blessed part to heaven, and slept in peace. So may he rest, his faults lie gently on him. Yet thus far, Griffiths, give me leave to speak him. He was a man of an unbounded spirit, ever ranking himself with princes. Simon, it was fair play to him. His own opinion was his law. In the presence, he would speak untruths and be ever double, both in words and meaning. His promises were, as he was then, mighty. But his performance was, as he then was, nothing. Of his own body he was ill, and gave the clergy ill example. May it please your highness to hear me speak his good now. Y yes, good Griffith, yes. I wear malicious else. This cardinal though from an humble stock undoubtedly was fashioned to much honor. From his cradle he was a scholar, yes. and a ripe and good one, exceeding wise, fair-spoken, and persuading. Lofty and sour to them that loved him not, but to those men that sought him, sweet as summer. And though he were unsatisfied in getting, which was a sin, yet in bestowing, madam, he was most princely. His overthrow heaped happiness upon him, for then, and not till then, he felt himself and found the blessedness of being little. And to add greater honors to his age than man could give him, he died fearing God. After my death, I wish no other herald, no other speaker of my living honors, and such an honest chronicler as Griffith, whom I most hated living, thou hast made me by thy religious truth and modesty, now in his ashes, honor. Peace be with him. Have patience, patience. 
Be near me still. Uh, set me lower. Uh, good Griffith, bid the musicians play me that sad note I named my knell, whilst I sit meditating on that celestial harmony I go to. She is asleep. Good wench, let's sit down quiet for fear we wake her. Softly, gentle patience. In her sleep, the Queen has a vision of six personages clad in white robes, solemnly tripping one after another. The first two hold a spare garland over her head, at which the other four make reverent curtsies. Then the two that held the garland deliver the same to the other two next, who hold the garland over her head. Which done, they deliver the same garland to the last two, who likewise observe the same order. Then they vanish, carrying the garland with them. Spirits of peace, where are ye? Are ye all gone? And leave me here in wretchedness behind. Madam, we are here. It was not you I called for. Saw ye not answer when I slept? None, madam. No, no. Saw ye not even now? A blessed troop invite me to a banquet whose bright faces shone beautiful beams upon me like the sun. They promised me eternal happiness and gave me honours, Griffith, which I feel I'm not yet worthy to wear. I shall, assuredly. I am most joyful, madam, such good dreams possess your fancy. Bid the musicians leave, they're sad and sorry to me. Do you note how much her grace is altered on the sudden? How long her face is drawn? How pale she looks? She is going, wench. Pray, pray. Griffith? Pray do my service to his majesty. He has my heart yet and shall have my prayers whilst I shall have my life. Tell him in death I blessed him. For so I will. Ah. Farewell. Good Griffith. Ah, nay, patience, you must not leave me, yet I, I must to bed. When I am dead, good wench, let me be used with honour. Strew me over with maiden flowers that all the world may know I was a chaste wife to my grave. Embalm me, then lay me forth. Although unqueened, yet like a queen and daughter to a king, inter me. I can no more. Next reading is a little Thackeray, Vanity Fair. Three young men of our acquaintance were enjoying that beautiful prospect of bow windows on the one side and blue sea on the other, which Brighton affords to the traveller. Sometimes it is towards the ocean, smiling with countless dimples, speckled with white sails, with a hundred bathing machines, kissing the skirt of his blue garment, that the Londoner looks enraptured. Sometimes, on the contrary, a lover of human nature rather than of prospects of any kind, it is towards the bow windows that he turns and that swarm of human life which they exhibit. From one issue the notes of a piano, which a young lady in ringlets practices six hours daily to the delight of the fellow lodgers. 
At another, lovely Polly, the nursemaid, may be seen dandling Master Omnium in her arms, whilst Jacob, his papa, is beheld eating prawns and devouring the times for breakfast at the window below. Yonder are the Misses Leary, who are looking out for the young officers of the heavies, who are pretty sure to be pacing the cliff. Or again, it is a city man with a nautical turn and a telescope the size of a six-pounder, who has his instrument pointed seawards so as to command every pleasure boat, herring boat, or bathing machine that comes to or quits the shore, etc., etc. But have we any leisure for a description of Brighton? For Brighton, a clean Naples with genteel lazzaroni, for Brighton, that always looks brisk, gay and gaudy like a harlequin's jacket. For Brighton, which used to be seven hours distant from London at the time of our story, which is now only a hundred minutes off, and which may approach who knows how much nearer, unless Joinville comes and untimely bombards it. What a monstrous fine girl that is in the lodgings over the milliners, one of these three promenaders remarked to the other. Gad, Crawley! Did you see what a wink she gave me as I passed? Don't break her heart, Joss, you rascal, said another. Don't trifle with her affections, you Don Juan. <laughs> Get away, said Joss Sedley, quite pleased, and leering up at the maidservant in question with a most killing ogle. Joss was even more splendid at Brighton than he had been at his sister's marriage. He had brilliant under waistcoats, any one of which would have set up a moderate buck. He sported a military frock coat ornamented with frogs, knobs, black buttons and meandering embroidery. He had affected a military appearance and habits of late and he walked with his two friends, who were of that profession, clinking his boot spurs, swaggering prodigiously and shooting death glances at all the servant girls who were worthy to be slain. What shall we do, boys, till the ladies return, the buck asked. The ladies were out to Rottingdean in his carriage on a drive. Oh, let's have a game at billiards, one of his friends said, the tall one with lacquered mustachios. Oh, no, damn it, no, Captain, Joss replied, rather alarmed. No billiards today, Crawley, my boy, yesterday was enough. You play very well, said Crawley, laughing. Don't he, Osborne? How well he made that five-stroke, eh? Famous, Osborne said. Joss is a devil of a fellow at billiards and at everything else, too. I wish there were any tiger hunting about here. We might go and kill a few before dinner. Ooh, there goes a fine girl. What an ankle, eh, Joss? Tell us that story about the tiger hunt and the way you did for him in the jungle. It's a wonderful story, that, Crawley. Here, George Osborne gave a yawn. It's rather slow work, said he down here. What shall we do? <laughs> I suddenly remembered it, oh, I don't know, it just, you know, floated into my subconscious. I had, don't know where I got it from, but it is in a book somewhere. Secretary being a bit of a realist, and he, he doesn't really care much for sentiment. Anyway, he wrote a little short four-verse poem about um, Werther, and it goes like this. Werther was in love with Charlotte, but his love he could not offer. Would you know how first he met her? She was cutting bread and butter. Charlotte was a married lady, and a moral man was worth her, and for all the tea in India would do nothing for to hurt her. So he sighed and pined and ogled, and his passion boiled and bubbled, till he blew his silly brains out, and no more by it was troubled. <laughs> Charlotte, having seen his body born before her on a shutter, like a well-conducted lady, went on cutting bread and butter. <laughs> Alec and I are now going to do an excerpt from Christopher Fry's The Dark is Light. Oh, how lovely. Life. Yes, I should love that. Captain Gettner has broken his oath to the Hungarian diet. Captain Gettner has deserted in the field. Captain Gettner, by the information he possesses, has become too threatening to my cause and country. For your one man, I have many countess, and I'm here to arrest him. If you wish to abide by your neutrality, madam, bring him out. Otherwise, I regret. We shall come in and find him. 
I have no weapons to prevent you, Colonel. The house will go down before you like matchwood. Your victory will be complete, if not glorious. Though I wonder you should think so unhopefully of your own argument that you meekly and unmanfully give in to violence when I am ready to be persuaded to your opinion by any truth which in God's world you can put before me. I realize readily time is your anxiety, but in the end, who drives the right way drives the fastest, as only today I have been reminded. I give you one promise. I shall never make myself or my friends, my way of life or private contentment, or any preference of my nature an obstacle to the needs of a more true and living world than so far I have understood. Only, tell me, what is in this war you fight worth all your dead and suffering men? Your faith is your country has been refused its good right for many years too long. So be certain, whatever the temptation, no man is made a slave by you. To you, Austria is a tyranny then to the number of those men who die, and far beyond that number, infinitely. Surely you will show one man over another has no kingdom. Otherwise, how shall I understand your war? Because I have respect for Richard Gettner's wandering and uncertain will, therefore I have respect for your sheer purpose and for those many men I cannot know by name who are waiting in the snow. But if you tell me Richard Gettner has thrown away his claim to freedom by claiming that a man is free, then you and those in the snow may as well march against your guns and swords. They are tyrannous too. Is it not a quaint freedom that lets us make up our minds and not be free to change them? <laughs> Or hope for me, I change my mind for pure relaxation two or three times a day as I get wiser or sillier, whichever it is I do. Must I save your cause for you, Colonel? If so, then not in my name or Richard Gettner's, but in the name of all your nameless fellows who trust their suffering is righteous. I forbid you to invade the liberties of this house. Well, this is the story of Nebuchadnezzar and the Fiery Furnace, a story which contains some very long lists. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the councillors, the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, <laughs> sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, 
Certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. <laughs> Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, <laughs> sackbut, psaltery and dulcimer and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, Sackbut, psaltery and dulcimer and all kind of music ye fall down and worship the image which I have made? Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter, if it be so. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire, and the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people nation and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. <laughs> This is...
a, a speech of St. Jones from Shaw's St. Joan. Where would you all have been now if I had heeded that sort of truth? There is no help, no counsel in any of you. Yes, I am alone on earth. I have always been alone. My father told my brothers to drown me if I would not stay to mind his sheep while France was bleeding to death. France might perish if only our lambs were safe. I thought France would have friends at the court of the King of France, and I find only wolves fighting for pieces of her poor, torn body. I thought God would have friends everywhere, because he is the friend of everyone. And in my innocence, I believed that you, who now cast me out, would be like strong towers to keep harm from me. But I am wiser now, and nobody is any the worse for being wiser. Do not think you can frighten me by telling me that I am alone. France is alone, and God is alone. And what is my loneliness before the loneliness of my country and my God? I see now that the loneliness of God is his strength. What would he be if he listened to your jealous little counsels? Well, my loneliness shall be my strength too. It is better to be alone with God. His friendship will not fail me nor his counsel, nor his love. In his strength, I will dare and dare and dare until I die. I will go out now to the common people and let the love in their eyes comfort me for the hate in yours. You will all be glad to see me burnt, but if I go through the fire, I shall go through it to their hearts forever and ever. And so, God be with me. Chant Pagan by Rudyard Kipling. Me that have been where I've been. Me that have gone where I've gone. Me that have seen what I've seen. How can I ever take on with awful old England again? And houses both sides of the street and edges two sides of the lane and the parson and gentry between and touching my hat when we meet. Me that have been what I've been. Me that have watched half a world heave up all shiny with dew, copped yon cop to the sun, and as soon as the mist let them through, our helios winking like fun, three sides of a ninety mile square over valleys as big as a shire. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? And then the blind drum of our fire. And I'm rolling his lawns for the squire. Me. Me, that have rode through the dark, forty mile off and on end, along the Mayollisburg range, with only the stars for my mark, and only the night for my friend, and things running off as you pass, and things jumping up in the grass, and the silence, the shine, and the sighs of the eye unexpressible skies. I am taking some letters almost as much as a mile to the post. And mind you come back with the change. Me. I will arise and get hence. I will trek south and make sure if it's only my fancy or not. That the sunshine of England is pale. And the breezes of England are stale. And there's something gone small with the lot. For I know of a sun and a wind and some plains and a mountain behind and some graves by a barbed wire fence and a Dutchman I fought who might give me a job were I ever inclined to look in and off saddle and live where there's neither a road nor a tree but only my maker and me and I think it will kill me or cure so I think I will go there and see me. <laughs> You're now going to go on to, to do the scene from the dream. You and Alec are going oh, to play... Oh, oh, darling, I thought, we, I thought that came before Catherine. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, well, darling. Are you prepared for yeah. this? Very well. All right. Yeah. Huh. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. Oh, what? <coughs> Jealous Oberon, fairest skip hence. I have forsworn his bed and company. Parry, rash, wanton. <laughs> Am I not thy lord? Oh, then I must be thy lady. 
But I know when thou hast stolen away from fairyland, and then the flights of Corin sat all day, playing on pipes of corn and versing love to amorous Philida, why art thou here come from the farthest steeps of India, but that forsooth your buskin mistress and your warrior love, to Theseus must be wedded, and you come to bring their bed joy and prosperity. How <laughs> canst thou thus for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus? Didst thou not lead him through the glimmering night from Perigenia, whom he ravished, and make him with fair eagle break his faith with Ariadne and Antiopa? These are the forgeries of jealousy. <laughs> and never since the middle summer spring met we on hill or vale, forest or mead, in plaged fountain or in bro bro something brook, but with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the winds piping to us in vain, as from the sea, have sucked up some contagious fogs, which falling in the land have every pelting river made so proud that they were born their continents. Do you amend it then? It lies in you. Hmm. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Ah, set your heart at rest. The fairy land buys not the boy of me. His mother was a votaress of my order. And in the spiced Indian air by night, have often had she gossiped at my side and sat with me on, by Neptune's yellow sands. But she, being mortal, of that boy did die. And for her sake do I rear up her boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. How long within this wood intend you stay? <laughs> Perhaps till Theseus' wedding day. <laughs> If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. If not, shun me and I will spare your haunts. Give me that boy and I will go with thee. <laughs> not for thy fairy kingdom. Fair is a way we should slide down right if I longer stay. <laughs> Forgive the fact that I am very old. <laughs> and I, it was sprung upon me rather suddenly. I thought we were going to do that before the death scene. It is rather confusing to be dead and then come to life again. <laughs> All right. No harm then. No, no offence taken. <laughs> now what? Now what? Um... And now, Gwen, I'm going to read an excerpt from Orlando, Ooh. the theme being winter. We had the winter play of Christopher Fry, and mm. now the winter excerpt yes. from yes. Orlando by yes. Virginia Woolf. But while the country people suffered the extremity of want, and the trade of the country was at a standstill, London enjoyed a carnival of the utmost brilliancy. The court was at Greenwich, and the new king seized the opportunity that his coronation gave him to curry favour with the citizens. He directed that the river, which was frozen to a depth of 20 feet and more for six or seven miles on either side, should be swept, decorated, and given all the semblance of a park or pleasure ground, with arbours, mazes, alleys, drinking booths, etc., at his expense. For himself and the courtiers, he reserved a certain space immediately opposite the palace gates, which, railed off from the public only by a silken rope, became at once the centre of the most brilliant society in England. Great statesmen in their beards and ruffs dispatched affairs of state under the crimson awning of the royal pagoda. Soldiers planned the conquest of the Moor and the downfall of the Turk in striped arbours surmounted by plumes of ostrich feathers. Admirals strode up and down the narrow pathways, glass in hand, sweeping the horizon and telling stories of the Northwest Passage and the Spanish Armada. Lovers dallied upon divans spread with sables. Frozen roses fell in showers when the Queen and her ladies walked abroad. Coloured balloons hovered motionless in the air. Here and there burnt vast bonfires of cedar and oak wood, lavishly salted, so that the flames were of green, orange, and purple fire. But however fiercely they burnt, the heat was not enough to melt the ice, which, though of singular transparency, was yet of the hardness of steel. So clear, indeed, was it that there could be seen, congealed at a depth of several feet, 
Here a porpoise, there a flounder. Shoals of eels lay motionless in a trance. But whether their state was one of death or merely suspended animation, which the warmth would revive, puzzled the philosophers. Near London Bridge, where the river had frozen to a depth of some 20 fathoms, a wrecked wherry boat was plainly visible, lying on the bed of the river where it had sunk last autumn, overladen with apples. The old bumboat woman, who was carrying her fruit to market on the Surrey side, sat there in her plaids and farthingales with her lap full of apples for all the world as if she were about to serve a customer. Though a certain blueness about the lips hinted the truth. It was a sight King James specially liked to look upon, and he would bring a troop of courtiers to gaze with him. In short, nothing could exceed the brilliancy and gaiety of the scene by day. But it was at night that the carnival was at its merriest, for the frost continued unbroken. The nights were of perfect stillness. The moon and stars blazed with the hard fixity of diamonds, and to the fine music of flute and trumpet, the courtiers danced. Would you like to do The Oxen by Thomas Hardy? Well, it's a, a Christmas time. I think I would like to speak it. Christmas Eve and twelve of the clock. Now they are all on their knees, an elder said, as we sat in a flock by the chimney in hearthside ease. We pictured the meek, mild creatures then as they knelt in their strawy pen. Nor did it occur to one of us there to doubt they were kneeling then. So fair a fancy, none would weave in this age. Yet I feel, if someone said on Christmas Eve, come, see the oxen kneel in the lonely barton by yonder coomb our childhood used to know. I should go with him in the gloom, hoping it might be so. When Frank and Davis was presenting with great pleasure in front of an invited audience at the Theatre Museum, Covent Garden.